And we are back for another casual conversation with the classic guys. And I'm here with none other than Arda or Cal. Guys, big fan. I just want to say this before we get started. I started my page in 2014. And when the likes of like you and Renee and Jimmy followed the page, uh, when you guys did, it meant a lot to me because I am a Canadian kid that watched Aftermath on the score, watched all you guys' post shows and pre shows, and was a fan. And you guys made it seem like, hey, like, even the world in Canada, we could probably make some stuff happen for wrestling. So thank you for that. How are you doing? That's awesome, Justin. Dan, thanks for having me on the show. And uh, that's really cool. Like, I can't believe how many people still bring up Aftermath like years after the fact. Like, mm-hmm. I still get people still bring that up to me, like the little things and any segments that we used to do on the show, like all like pretty regularly on social media. And it's shocking to me every time. Yeah. I guess it. I guess it left a, a mark on uh, on some wrestling fans in Canada, which is great because we had a blast doing the show. It was it was awesome. Mm-hmm. Yeah, were you part of creating that show? Did it happen? Was yeah. that like your creation, or how did how did that happen? Definitely my baby. Uh, so how it happened was uh, back in the day. You you two would know uh, for the yeah. benefit of the audience. Like the score n- today, the score is a sports app, right? That's yeah. really what it's known for. But back in the day, I'm talking like 2010 the score had multiple media properties. So there was the score television network, which was a national TV station, a national TV sports station. Uh, there was also hardcore sports radio, which was a serious channel. Uh, and you know, these pro these entities and properties were either sold or uh, absorbed by other companies, whatever the case may be. Right. But at that time, that's what was in the portfolio for, um, you know, the score. And we were, how it basically happened was, as you guys know, like in the Canadian sports media landscape, it was really TSN and Sportsnet. And mm-hmm. it's still the case today that has every major sports rights in yeah. Canada, right? Like NHL, MLB, NBA, NFL, either occupied by Sportsnet or TSN. And the score, the only thing that they had, the biggest thing that they had by far, I should say, was WWE. And yeah. Raw was their biggest rating every single week. That Monday night was lucrative for the station. And so I happened to be, at the time, a volunteer. Like, I was an intern, really, uh, for Hardcore Sports Radio. But that allowed me to get a company email address, which is important to the story. Because soon after that, we got an e- a company-wide email from the VP of uh, programming that essentially said, here's a one-page form i'm attaching to this email if you have any ideas feel free to fill it out and so then i just filled it out with this you know we have hockey pre and post game shows we have other sports why can't we do a wwe pre and post game show or Mm -hmm. something to that effect because we all know like justin and dan you know that if you're a wrestling fan and you're watching ron smackdown chances are you're going to stick around if you don't have to change the channel at all, you're sticking around for at least a couple minutes to hear what people in studio might have to say, whether you agree with it or not, right? Like, it's kind of a no-brainer, especially for how passionate wrestling fans are. So that's yeah. why I pitched it, and there were enough people in the building that were wrestling savvy, and lucky for me, that idea caught fire pretty quickly internally. Like, I got called mm-hmm. into the um, office to talk about it, and it got greenlit in December of 2009 and it was on the air for well after I left the score it was must have been like 10 years and that's quite the run for Canadian television right yeah, yeah and it went from score to Sportsnet the same name the same show yeah when it all tried and that to that little fun story prior to the pandemic I reached out to a uh, Sportsnet I I put a whole package together for them and this and that about kind of being like why don't we have like a Canadian social media page like why isn't there like a Sportsnet WWE page, and they were all in for it, in for it, and then somewhere in the pandemic aftermath, and, uh. and the whole thing fell apart. But I was like, man, we were this close. Like we were actually having conversations back and forth. Like, think that's a good idea, yada yada yada. But doesn't um, mean no, you like, can't resurrect it later. You know, like 100%. you can put that in your back pocket and do it in like two years or something. You know, hundred percent. And it's also really cool because you know you're talking about you guys started in 2009. That's when I graduated high school. Hence, I've been watching. I guess since the very beginning, but. It was kind of like now, like for anyone that, uh, you know, if I put this out a little bit later, like we're recording on Friday, SmackDown just went off the air Mm -hmm. and there's probably a plethora of people on social media doing SmackDown post shows right now, live podcasts, Twitter spaces. You guys were kind of ahead of the time with that because that wasn't the case back then. 
No, like there cool. weren't there weren't <laughs> yeah. many live post shows or at, at the very least, the post shows for anything would actually be on linear. Like very few were actually on digital, you know, yeah. to mm -hmm. that degree. But I will say absolutely one of the the key reason why Aftermath survived as long as it did was because it had the benefit of the lead in audience of the show itself. It aired right after Raw. It yeah. aired right after SmackDown. So you have the biggest possible, the best possible lead in audience to a studio show like that. Yeah. And that's yeah. why it made it quite successful because oftentimes we would actually retain a much larger portion of the audience than any other programming would after a big, a highly rated game or something because it was completely true to the subject matter that you were just watching, right? So No, 100%. Okay. No worries. So we jumped right into Aftermath um, because obviously I was a big fan. I wanted to bring that up. And it, it did mean a lot when you guys followed the page. and that you Everyone guys outside support. of Canada is like, what are you talking yeah. about? What is this? <laughs> so I mean, we need to introduce you better. We need to get into this. But like, I just want to bring up that it did mean a lot that you you guys, like when you followed the page and Renee followed the page and Jimmy, yeah. I was like, it's cool for me because I, to an extent, watched you guys on TV so much. I was like, oh, the fact that they're supporting whatever silly thing I got going on here, like that's like super cool to me because I looked at you guys as people from Canada that got to like, you, you loved wrestling and you got to make something out of it and you provided more wrestling content for us Canadians. No, and I thought it was super cool. So it meant a lot. So that being said, I want to know a little bit more about you and wrestling because did a bunch of research, learned a bunch of stuff I didn't know about yet. But let's start at the very beginning, the most cliche question. Like, what are your earliest memories of professional wrestling? How did you become a fan? Uh, very early in my life. It was hockey and pro wrestling. They were my two yeah. like biggest loves growing up. Uh, hard not to be a hockey fan when you grew up in Canada, but I was about to say oh, very oh. similar for me. Yeah, I'm right. You, you can wrestling. relate, right? You can relate. I'm sure Danny yeah. relate too, right? Like we're from uh, pretty much the same town, Toronto, right? So, like, yeah, pro wrestling like was like an instant love. Uh, you know, it. I would say like my earliest memory of like wanting to watch a pay per view was probably WrestleMania six. Uh, that was Hogan Warrior, and yeah. That one was like, because I think it was because there was such big hoopla in Toronto for it, right? Because yeah. it was at the Sky Dome and the Sky Dome was new and it was less than a year old, I think, at the time. And like it was such a giant event and it was the first WrestleMania outside of the United States. And it was, you know, a big deal for Toronto to have it. And it just mm -hmm. captured the city, you know, the vibe of the city. And and I got caught up in that as a kid. And you know, I didn't get to watch it live. I didn't get to go. My first live event was like 97. So I was like, I don't know, 16. Like I, it was later in life. Yeah. Like I did not get to yeah. go as a kid at all. It was all. a seven year journey to get to your first show. Exactly. Yeah. But I was watching it on TV and I had like a um, older family friend. Uh, he was like my 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 hero in a way. Like I everything he loved, I sort of absorbed and he loved pro wrestling. And that's really where it sort of like ignited for me but though definitely that uh i definitely you know got through, i i was one that actually loved the new generation era like that early 90s yeah. before the attitude era i loved that era because well bret hart obviously for a big reason right like yeah. bret hart was awesome and he was my guy but like there were a lot of great wrestlers and like i don't know i, I just i didn't Looking back on it now, it's kind of funny to say that because of all how powerful the other eras were. But like, yeah. I, it holds a special place in my heart. Like, if I deep dive on like pay per views or like want to like you know drill into the minutia of things as I used to want to do a, a lot with wrestling, it was definitely those early '90s pay per views because they were fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. I can definitely agree with you because I was like a kid at that time and mm -hmm. my older brother, similar story, like my older brother loved wrestling. He's an 80s kid. He's a, he grew up a Hulkamaniac and had all the LJN figures and the magazines and the yeah. Coliseum videos and everything. So like I was surrounded by it for as long as I can remember. But that new generation era was like, as a kid, like I love the Macho Man because he was colorful wearing cowboy hats and Brett was wearing pink and it was just colorful and it was fun. And I always tell people like my first Undertaker was that purple glove Undertaker. Like that's what's always going to hold the most significance to me. So I totally relate with that. How did you get involved with professional wrestling? Because then, from yeah. what I read, you started doing a whole bunch of stuff on the independents. Yeah, like that happened a lot later. Uh, so yeah. this was well after the first show I ever did, and this was not me breaking into the business. This just happened to. I don't even know how this happened to <laughs> me. I, I remember I discovered, and I didn't even know what independent wrestling was. All I knew was uh, World Wrestling Federation. And then when the Monday Night Wars, and, and, and you guys might remember this, 
Canada didn't really have a Monday Night Wars. No. Like, we had Raw on Mondays, usually on delay, because TSN would preempt it to, like, midnight or whatever. But then Nitro would be on, like, Wednesdays, also on TSN. Yeah. Like, it was like, it, there was no, like, sense of, oh, man, I got to flip the channels. Like, we didn't have the option. Yeah, yeah no, it was, literally, it was literally on Wednesdays, I remember. And yeah. I was so young, sometimes I'd have to catch the replay of Raw on, tu- on yeah. Tuesday afternoons. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah. get home from school as fast as I can so I can catch like, the 2.30 version of it. Exactly, but, exactly. Yeah, we did it, so like, we got to enjoy both the best of both worlds, and that's why I kind of like, I'm like, I wish I could go about WWF and WCW. Like, I enjoyed them both. Exactly, because we had the opportunity to consume them at different times, and there was no internet to sort of spoil things for us, right? Like, yeah. unless it was like Tony Schiavone telling us, That'll put butts in seats or whatever, you know, like that kind of stuff with Mick Foley winning the championship or something like that. But like um, that, but I didn't know anything about the independence. I didn't know any, any, I didn't know anything at the time about like how wrestlers made it right. Like, or yeah. how they trained or whatever. And that's so like, I happened to just see a flyer in the late nineties for an indie wrestling show. And I was like, man, we got to check this out. Like, this looks so cool. Like, who are these people? They're wrestling. Like, this is a thing. So I went to check it out and I was like, wow, this is like, actual wrestling sort of similar to what I'm watching on TV and it's like local here and there's, you know, not thousands of people, but like dozens of people here, but like, it was still kind of cool to me, you know, and they were interacting with the fans a lot more. And it was like, wow, like it kind of opened my eyes to like different wrestling in a way, you know? So that's how I got introduced to the independence. And then for some reason, I don't even remember how this happened, but I did, I went to a flea market in Mississauga yeah. And they had a wrestling show there. And for some reason, they let me do live commentary on this battle royal. And Showtime Eric Young was in this battle royal. I bring this up to him all the time. <laughs> I don't think he remembers it. But it was just like so random that I would be allowed to do this. Maybe because it was like a, I don't know. I, I honestly have no idea why. Yeah. But like, were that you, was the were first you, show that I did. Were you already in the broadcast journalism world at that point? A or little was it bit, just... but not like, like yeah, maybe a little bit, but mm-hmm. like it definitely wasn't like me trying to break into the business. That happened like in 06 when, yeah. um yeah, that's when like I started to like dive into it and go to indie shows and help out, like help set up the ring yeah. and the chairs and all that stuff and put up flyers around the town. And that's when I started to like get into the indie family. So yeah, it, that was 06 until probably like 2014. Uh, when I was like, really, really deep in the Indies. Did you ever consider, even if we were younger, but did you ever consider like maybe becoming a professional wrestler? Did that ever cross your mind? <laughs> never. Not once. <laughs> no, I never, okay. wanted, never. My guy growing up was Mean Gene. I wanted to be Mean Gene. Oh, so I you wanted, wanted to be, be that? Yeah. Yeah. You, I wanted you know, to be Mean I, Gene. I, fair enough. Like, I'm like, I, I, people ask me that. I'm like, I think I did once upon a time, like maybe when I was like six, seven, eight years old. But I'm like, I broke so many bones just like, wrestling my friends in our backyards and playing street hockey like being a really dumb goalie and like <laughs> i was like i don't think i'm fit to be a wrestler guys <laughs> like, yeah, I don't think. no no i never but, cared. Uh, yeah well so like so okay so you want to be like me and gene so do you so when you started uh working the independent stuff like you did commentary was it just a one-time occasion before 06 or was it like something after you did that first time you continued to do it i think they the thing is like the indies the 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 promoters were impressed that i was doing stuff with at the time i was also doing stuff at rogers tv so yeah. like rogers tv for people unaware it was like a public access channel and they had the rights to like the ontario hockey league which is like one of the biggest feeder systems into the nhl right like a lot of people who will play in that league will eventually end up getting drafted and you know eventually make it to the nhl kind of thing so like i did games for rogers tv and i was like working there and so like that sort of gave me a little bit of like broadcast cachet to then go to the independent wrestling circuits and say, uh, hey, can I like help out here? And they were like, yeah, you you know, you know, have this background and you have this resume that it's good enough for us to have you come and do some matches or ring announce or whatever. So I did that for, for several years and it was, a, it was awesome. And actually yeah. like I, I developed like this kinship and this like, like desire to see the Ontario indie wrestlers succeed, you know? Like whatever yeah. one got signed, it was like a big deal. Like I, it was awesome to see because back then there was no AEW, right? Like it was extremely difficult to get to, it was difficult to get to WWE. It still is like, it's still, you know, tippy top of the mountain kind of thing. But like, there were really no other alternatives or very, very few to yeah. actually like make a livable wage in wrestling as a worker. Right. So 100%. do you remember seeing any of like the Ontario indie uh, wrestlers at the time? Like, do you remember any of the names? That have made it. That have made it. Uh, 
Sean Spears was around. Oh, uh, he stuff. definitely, yeah. yeah, for sure. He was uh, around. There's there's a bunch that uh, came up and down the ranks. Like we would we would use like 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 um, Ed, Edge and Christian would come around to our shows all the time because they, yeah. they like you know their their families were uh, local, so they would come and pop by the shows. Christian would work with us, especially when he was with TNA. Uh, TNA that was a boon for us because we essentially became TNA Canada or TNA <laughs> Ontario I should say because they would allow their talent to go work independence at that time yeah. especially right and so and the and the reason they wanted to work with us was because we we were paying the their per day rates we were paying better than what TNA would be paying them Oh, wow. Don't get me That's wrong. Crazy. Like the, TNA, working for TNA, you'd still get a lot more money overall throughout the year. Yeah. But the per day rates on the independents were larger, right? So a lot of TNA talent would love to work independents, and we were a reliable independent. So guys like Rhino would come through all the time. Like he was living in Detroit, so he'd drive in um, all the time. Bobby Roode was local. He would he would work with us all the time. Uh, yeah, uh, Cr Christian, uh, we brought him uh, to like remote. I remember we took him to the Canadian, we went to Iqaluit, the Canadian Arctic in none of it. We did <laughs> yeah. shows up there and it's like surreal that we still did this, but like he was in between TNA and WWE that I think this was 08. Like yeah. he, he was just about to go back to WWE and there was like a, a, a half a month period and yeah. we just so happened to have this show and he was like, yeah, okay, I'll come. So we, so we came awesome. to the Canadian Arctic and did two shows and like here we are like watching a Leafs game eating raw whale after the game. Like trying the local <laughs> cuisine. It's, it's just like this, this is amazing. Crazy. Yeah, it's, yeah, it was called Muktuk. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember. I don't forget that. Yeah. So, does it was there ever a period of time? So, I like asking this question. I feel like it happens to a lot of people. Was there ever a period of time that you felt like you fell out of love with wrestling, or was it just a thing that you just stayed with? And as much as you were doing stuff in broadcast journalism, maybe some stuff with other sports, it was just always there for you. I fell out of wrestling at the tail end of my time with WWE. That's when okay, I really okay. fell out of uh, love with wrestling or I just sort of was burnt out. I should say I was burnt out from wrestling. I was never burnt out from wrestling while chasing that dream of making it to WWE because I was just hyper focused and super ambitious. And once I got there and, and, and again, like everyone always asks me, are you bitter? Do you have any sort of absolutely not? I yeah. was ready to leave, even though my stint was short. I was not watching the product. I was not. I was. I was not watching any wrestling. I was ready to go back into sports. I just needed a change of scenery, and I really needed a paradigm shift in my mind. Like I needed to re to find that passion again, uh, yeah. especially for broadcasting, because it was just. I was just dragging my feet uh, mm -hmm. at, at a certain point in WWE, and that's that's toxic for for. Um, for you as a as a as a person to grow, right? It's just yeah. not conducive to growth. So that's when I started to get disillusioned. And and quite frankly, like when I left WWE, I was like, all right. Uh, I honestly thought I would never dip my toe back into wrestling again. I was like, this chapter is closed. I'm happy that it happened. I'm glad that the journey was, you know, there was a lot of fun, a lot of positives overall. It was a fantastic experience. But soon after, I got back into hockey, and then you know things worked out for me. Got to ESPN, etc. But I don't know, like after a while, it, it, I just felt more and more. It wasn't like like it's it's difficult to explain. I don't watch wrestling religiously anymore. Like I yeah. keep up with certain things. I see clips on social media. I'm very happy when I see my friends doing very well or people that I worked with become successful. Uh, that's always awesome. But I'm not there day to day, hour to hour, minute to minute, that kind of thing, especially like yeah. with both companies. I don't watch that anymore uh, to mm -hmm. that degree. But I do have like I, I do find myself like saying if there was like a interesting project that I could work on that would fit around my schedule, I would definitely uh, entertain that or I would definitely pursue that. And I've been to WWE since a couple times, like doing like documentary talking head kind of stuff. Yeah. And it was great. It was really cool, like to see old friends and everything, but also like sort of. Listen, if if Kyle Edwards can complete the story, so can Cody Rhodes. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, so when did, so I I, I want to come back to the Kyle Edwards thing <laughs> yeah. because I but like when did that become a goal for you? Like when was it like your goal went from you're doing some stuff in the independence, you're still doing the broadcast journalism stuff, obviously you're working with the Rogers TV. When did it become a goal for you? Like, hey, you know what? There's an opportunity where because when I did research on you, when I watched your TED talk, when I everything I've done in the last few days, I'm like, you know the one thing about Arda is that it seems like from my perspective personally 
you in a way kind of create opportunities for yourself. You see yeah. a window, you grasp it, and then you kind of create an opportunity for yourself and try to make something out of whatever situation you're in. So at what point did you think like, oh, the WWE is like an option? Like that's that's a viable real dream that I can try to go after. And often something out of nothing. Like I yeah, I, just even broadcasting, like I had no friends, no contacts no family nobody in broadcasting yeah. everything that i have been able to achieve or accomplish happened from the start of zero like from, yeah, well, i mean even from your degrees floor. your degree said if it's correct I, I don't take wikipedia for serious news ever but i did say your degree was <laughs> mathematics and yeah and, and math and development. It, from uh, yeah it wasn't broadcast yeah. journalism so like no like, like how no. did you get into that like how did it all happen like what's the story but rogers tv the reason they accepted me was because i could drive a car they needed volunteers oh, wow. that could drive a car. That's it. I went into the building. I thought that it was cool to work somewhere at a TV station. Instead of going out nights and weekends, partying with my friends, I went to the local public access channel because it was fun. And they needed someone, a volunteer that could drive to like charity events and five kilometer runs and set up a table with a with a wheel that people would spin and get like gifts, like knickknacks, like, you know, here's a yeah. pen or here's whatever, a lanyard. And so I did that and I said, in exchange, can I come and shadow the shows and be around it and ask questions and blah, blah, blah. And they were like, yeah, sure. Here's a pass. And I just used that as carte blanche to go in as much as I wanted to. And no one said anything. They mm -hmm. didn't care. They were just like, as long as you're doing what we ask you to do, you can take your own time and do whatever you want to do. Now, I had the benefit of, you know, living close to the station and being able to do that as much as possible and sort of you know, hit the ground running kind of thing. And eventually there were open auditions. I was urged to audition. I did. And then it got me to like a, you know, my first on-air show. And that's where I sort of started, started to think like, maybe this is something I really want to pursue full time. Mm -hmm. And that's when I, yeah. you know, kind of made the switch, but like, yeah, it's just, I don't know, man. Like, like I, I hear what you're saying. Like it's, I, 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 very like get stuff done mentality with me. You know what I mean? Like yeah. see, believe, achieve, but also like just, you know, it, it set a goal and then be in service of that goal. And when I decided like my first audition at WWE was 2009 and yeah. I was not ready. It was awful. I sucked. It was terrible. I was green as grass. It did not go well. And they didn't call me back for four years. And honestly, Aftermath was probably the reason I did get called back because at, at one point, WWE started to watch every episode of Aftermath because it was almost like a quality control kind of thing. And so that's where I started to get over with people in the in the building again. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like it was almost yeah. like I had to change their minds on me and Aftermath helped me do that. So mm -hmm. like all the pieces like were falling together. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 yeah, I feel like everything kind of just happened for a reason, right? Like the fact that you didn't get called back for four years helped you kind of reinvent yourself in a way and like reevaluate like, okay, how can I become better in this time off and, you know, kind of sort of assess the situation. You know what I mean? And, and here's the thing. That's a good point, because like in that four years, you can envision a lot of people just quitting and just being like, ah, this is not for me. Yeah. Like, yeah, but I had to build. Mm -hmm every every day of those four years in order to get another opportunity and i actually share this too like it was it wasn't just oh four years later i got an audition and then i got hired i had three more auditions after that second one mm -hmm. so i had the second one in 2013 uh that's i didn't get that job i did well in the audition i came in second and then i got a call from michael cole and he was just starting in and around that time he was sort of just starting to be involved in hiring the broadcasters Gosh, right like he yeah. was overseeing yeah. and becoming like he a was director becoming the head of the broadcast exactly like he now. Yeah. yeah and he and he had a very frank meeting with me like a, or a very very frank very honest conversation with a lot of good advice and one of the things he says was look like and and and, and this is not the case today I, this is this was for its time back in 2013 he said look yeah. if you want to work at wwe if you want to work here you have to do everything but wrestling Build your resume in every realm other than pro wrestling. That means indies. That means WWE content. Do everything but that. That was the edict that was given to me. It was almost it's like so a challenge. Because everything you've said, even the last like five, ten minutes of stuff yeah. I've heard, like 
they're gonna say no to you a lot. Oh, they don't like people that are too in wrestling. Like I've heard yeah. all this in the last ten right. years. I've like like I like I've got heard been told by talent many times like, hey, we know you, we know you're cool, but it's the fact that you're too much wrestling. They might not have interest in you. Right. Or they're gonna say no to you a million times before they say yes, Justin. And then the last thing that you brought up, which is, and I do want to talk about a little bit of the positives of the Kyle Edwards era, but. Yeah. I've heard it a million times, and I've I've had it been told to me a million times. Like Justin, you're very passionate about this. You love this stuff. We all know it. There's a fifty percent chance you can come here, and not that like you're gonna dislike wrestling, but it'll kill your passion a little bit. Like you're too involved in it that you stop watching it. You know, like you know what I mean. Like you're is that kind of what happened with you? Do you feel like because once you became too much in it working at WWE, did you kind of like lose the love for wrestling a little bit? I think a part of it is like things didn't progress as quickly as I would have wanted it to at WWE yeah. or I felt like I didn't necessarily get the opportunities I was hoping for while I was there. And that sort of disillusions you a little bit. Now, that's nobody's fault. At the end of the day, maybe I could have been better or I could have been more undeniable or whatever, however you want to frame it. Yeah. That, that, but that in any job, if that doesn't come as quickly as you want, like that promotion or whatever, you're going to be salty about it in some Not way, shape, or form, yeah. right? It goes back so, to growth, right? Once you've started exactly. going stagnant, like, you're like, exactly. Like, I just yeah. felt like I was at a level where I believe that that's where I would have stayed for the next 20 years. And if, if they were just continue, if they were just going to continue to re sign me for like one or two years at a time and, I would just remain doing these shows. Still a pretty good life, right? But yeah, yeah. if you're ambitious and you want to like build and grow, that's not the way to do it. Or that just wouldn't, it just didn't feel like it was in the cards for me based on the conversations I was having, right? Yeah. So, but going back to what I said after the, I've, I hung up with Cole, that's what I did. And that's actually where I ended up uh, going into, of all things, I... After I left the score, I got into weather. I was doing like weather reporting and it was a hilarious gig. It was it was great. It was a lot of fun. It was very it was like a morning I'm, show. I'm laughing because he's like, I know I've seen him somewhere else. It wasn't just sports and the score. And I'm like, where? And he's like, Oh, I think he used to be on the weather channel. <laughs> yeah. And, and and I lived so I lived in Ottawa for three months in the winter. Yeah. That was oh my God, that was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. By the way, the the thing that blew up my phone, other than Sports Center, Sports Center was uh definitely a blow up your phone moment and 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 yeah. signing with WWE but the biggest one was covering a uh blizzard in Ottawa because <laughs> the entire country was watching for some reason this was like a like a really really bad blizzard and i'm yeah. out there like holding a pole and shaking and i'm like freezing you know like it's like it's really bad out here tom like I, you know you could tell it's like mine is 30 and you can see cars behind me they're wiping out they're hitting uh, you know, they're getting into uh, big snow piles. You got to be safe out there. Back to you in studio, Tom. And then Tom makes a dumb joke about like, oh, I'm glad I'm not outside. And I'm like, thanks, Tom, because I've been out here for like three hours, <laughs> you know. But um, yeah. and then that's where I got to Vancouver, too. I I had the I had a oh, blast good. in Vancouver, dude. It yeah. was the best. I lived in uh, Yale Town. Oh, there, I was there for okay. a year. It was the best. Yeah. Dude, yeah. that was the best life because the weather's the same every day. It was like the easiest yeah. job. Yeah, yeah. Like we don't like we get a little <laughs> bit of rain. We get a little bit of snow, never as much as you guys do in the East Coast. And then yeah. we get a lot of rain, but like it's our weather's like what you would expect it to be. Like we just have seasons. You know it's gonna rain from yeah. like September to January, May-ish. <laughs> May to May to September, you know it's gonna be nice and sunny. In January, February, you might get some, it's very predictable weather. Oh yeah. It's and then like every that. once a once every two weeks they sent me to Whistler to do like ski reports. <laughs> And I'm like, yeah. oh no, that sounds terrible. Yeah, yeah. And you've done the drive with all the mountains. Yeah, and the water yeah, yeah. And the views. Beautiful. He he actually just came to Vancouver for the first time. So Daniel's actually an independent wrestler. He's training out in Ontario. Get out. That's so, awesome. Who's your trainer? Um, Gabriel Forza. I don't know if you remember. Okay. No. He used to train at the, the Squared Circle in Toronto. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I know them. Yeah, Rob he, Fuego. Yeah, that was that, that, yeah. that was what I was affiliated with. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so Rob okay, so he trained with he, he trained with Fuego, so now he has his yeah. own school. Oh, that's uh, awesome. He trains at a uh, battle at Centino School. Oh, yeah. fantastic. That's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's awesome. How's so, it going? Hey, it's good, man. Yeah, yeah. I've been training since the summer of 2022. So I'm just trying right. to learn as much as I can. But yeah, it's 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 a journey, man. Like I started off as like doing interviews and stuff. So, like I interviewed yeah. Justin, uh Tyson Kidd, Brad Hart, like just some names and Amazing. stuff. Just to kind of network and gauge and like I know I 
so I was new. I wanted to wrestle. And like during the pandemic, I was like, okay, I need a network. I need to do something. So I started my own podcast with a buddy of mine, we networked. And like, I knew once the lockdown was done, I was like, okay, I'm going to make my time worth of what I did. And once I started training, things just kind of paid off. But yeah, man, it's been great. Like, I'm just trying to get out there more and, you know, do what so I he can. Came out of that, he, he came out of Vancouver and I took him to a bunch of independent shows out here and down in Seattle. Yeah. Was that, dude, and there was a healthy wrestling scene when I was there, man. Yeah, the, and, uh, uh, ECCW, I think, was one yeah, of the promotions. That was one of them. Uh, the Bollywood the Boys were there at the time. My yeah, guys, you got to I see the Bollywood guys. Boys. They're yeah, great. They're guys. great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, awesome. But then he was also shocked. He's like, "You guys have so many mountains." So <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Right, yeah. right. Well, Dan, listen, yeah. we could talk. We could talk Ontario Indies another time. Oh yeah, uh, man. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But okay, so I'm curious though, because like, okay, so you worked with the WWE, left WWE, and then you got back and like, was hockey like you're like, this is my other love. Now I'm gonna go pursue hockey. Was that the goal or? So early in my career. Uh, I wanted to be like, I, my first hope was to be a hockey, uh, host. Like I wanted to be like Ron McLean. I wanted to do the intermissions. Like he was like my guy growing up and, uh, I got advice early in my career that I wouldn't necessarily give to other people, but I completely understand why it was given to me. And in a way, I'm glad I did follow it. The advice was. If you want to be a hockey broadcaster, at your, at your point in your career, it's going to be extremely difficult to become one because there are so few seats that you can occupy at the top levels. And even if those seats become available, especially in Canada, there are dozens upon dozens of people with more experience than you, with more cachet than you or name value or, hey, this person deserves a shot kind of thing uh, that will even receive auditions for that job, let alone be considered whatever or get that job. So mm-hmm. my advice to you, Arda, is try the road less traveled, find something more niche, make a name for yourself there, and then hope to make a jump. Now, we all know, the two of you know, that now it's not as bad as it is as it was before, but back in the day, you would get pigeonholed very, very quickly if you were only doing pro wrestling. Yeah. And that's why I kept the foothold in other things like OHL, uh, you know, talk shows, et cetera, because at least I could have that on my resume and current while I was still doing pro wrestling, because then I'm not just the wrestling guy, because unfortunately, yeah. that's the way that hiring managers, many hiring managers would see you back in the day. They would just see wrestling on a resume and be like, yep, you're the wrestling person. We don't need one kind of thing. Yeah. Right. So. Uh, when I did that, I, I, I made that switch and I, I dove into wrestling and luckily it worked out for me, but I wouldn't give that advice to other people because it sort of diminishes someone's dream. You know, it's, I don't think it's fair to do that. I think it's fair to be realistic, but I don't think it's fair to dissuade them or, or discourage them from chasing what they want to chase. Yeah, no, I feel that because it kind of yeah discourages you. It kind of makes you think like they kind of made it seem like it's almost impossible. Yeah, there's like a one percent chance. Mm-hmm. Um, but you're doing it. So like, what was the route there for you? Because you're 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 a hockey broadcaster now. So, what what ended up happening was I I, I had all that hockey experience. I got to WWE. I left WWE, and it's really like sometimes they say you know uh, right place, right time. I, when I left WWE, I knocked on the door of ESPN because they were just launching a WWE vertical. And I said, can I contribute to this vertical? I have a lot of great experiences I can share, et cetera. And they said, sure, but also we have a need for a desk host for esports. And I didn't know anything about esports back yeah. in the day. And I learned pretty quickly because you say yes to everything. But that's how I got my start with ESPN doing uh, esports coverage. And I'm glad I did because esports is 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 crazy fun. But yeah, like just very random that that's how my in that would be my in to ESPN. But uh, at the same time, MSG Networks, which is one of the regional networks in uh, based out of New York, they have Rangers games, Devils games, Islanders games, Knicks, etc. And they were looking to launch a hockey show, and I just happened to uh, apply. And they called me in. It wasn't even an audition. They just called me into yeah. a boardroom. I had a conversation. And lucky for me, I guess I impressed them enough that they offered me the job. 
And was so, it because you were Canadian? Was it like, that's what the Canadian guy was like, like, oh, yeah, this guy's Canadian. You must know hockey. That's it. That's <laughs> great. Must, yeah, sure. You must that's know. Cool. You Whatever. Yeah, yeah, sure. Like, yeah. Whatever. <laughs> exactly. I've seen a couple of clips of you doing OHL. It's good enough. <laughs> like that. So luckily that worked out for me. And then that show was for two years. And then I was at MSG for about four or five. So uh, it worked out in that sense. That's crazy. So, like, are you like I like I'm, I'm scared to ask, but like, are you like a diehard Toronto Meat Leafs guy or what? I grew the... up a Leafs fan. Yeah. Uh, but like, dude, honestly, once you start working for teams, you kind of care about people. Like, yeah, I could I could pinpoint like three or four people that I would be extremely happy for on many teams if they were to win the Stanley Cup. You know what I mean? Just because it's like when you get like, to know people, right? Yeah, it's like relationships. It's almost you know like when people you ask me, people ask me these like who are your favorite wrestlers? I'm like I can't pick any of the new guys because I'm gonna have major biases. Like you know, it's not like when I was a kid and I'm like I like the Macho Man because I like the Macho Man. Like I can't right. Like I you re- start working exactly. You start working yeah. with them. Like I said, like the Ontario indie guys, like or uh, um, the Ontario indie workers. Like when they make it to WWE, I feel like a sense of pride in that. Like, even the Bollywood boys. Like I hung out with yeah. them a lot when I was oh, in Vancouver. Yeah. And speaking of working hard, those two work harder than anyone. They are like impressive how hard it's impressive how hard they work. But like when they made it to WWE, I was like, I couldn't, I was at like the lowest point of me watching WWE, but I would watch their stuff just because I was so happy for them. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like, 100%. I, it wasn't even just like, it wasn't even like I was enjoying it because they were doing it. You know, yeah. it was like, oh, this is amazing. I'm so happy this is happening. So yeah. yeah, like you support the people you end you end up building exactly. with. It's like exactly. it's like indirect. I'm like I can't be honest. It's gonna be a lie. I'm just gonna start picking people that <laughs> have been nice to me and supported me. And I've like you know what I mean. Like yeah, that's what's exactly. gonna happen. They here, develop so. relationships with. It's totally true. So like I'd be happy if the Leafs won a cup just because the city of Toronto would it'd be like a heck of a party. And I'm oh, yeah. I'd be happy for the city because they've been long suffering. But like other yeah. than that. You know, I could think of a lot of people in the league that I'd be happy for if they were to win a cup. So I'm, I'm, I'm from Vancouver, by the way. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I know, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. What happened? 94, 2011. <laughs> yeah, I was, was, 94, I was 94. is a little too young. That was like my brother's situation. But I was there for 2011. And yeah. I don't think I like my heart. Like, I loved hockey. Like, I can't explain. Like, yeah, yeah, we had, yeah. Like, I had a whole situation growing up where, like, I, my parents spoiled me a little bit, I guess, because I'm the youngest. But, like, every town we went to, I got a hockey jersey from. Like, an actual, like, I got, like, an Edmonton <laughs> jersey and a Calgary jersey. And a, yeah. like a buffalo jersey and like for some reason, whatever city yeah. went through i got a jersey from and i know what it's like to like follow a team and them winning because like i was like a huge colorado avalanche fan for some reason when they had patrick Waugh and peter forsberg and sackick and hey duke and they won the cup and i was like so cool and then i like tried to stay on the vancouver bandwagon and be like this is my local team i'm gonna support them and then 2011 happened it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, so kind of rough but I heard they're doing really good this year. Like I've been trying to tune in. Everyone's like, "Oh, the Canucks are doing good again. You might have to jump back on." I'm like, "They're oh, great. Please. They are very they good. Are? They, they're cup contenders for sure." Are absolutely. they really? Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh no, very good. Oh no, I'm, I'm I, I just hope they don't lose in the cup final again, and then we get a repeat of what happened after they lost in 2011. And it, it was actually so depressing too, because I was at that age where like we'd go downtown all the time. I luckily did not go downtown for that last game against Boston, so okay, I was not good. there for the riots. I was yeah, so, not there for the that riots, was the. Yeah. For some reason, my buddy's like, hey, listen, we're barbecuing at my house. Why don't we just hang out here instead? If they lose, it's going to be crazy down there. And it's going to be crazy mm-hmm. trying to get home. And I'm like, you know what? The whole trying to get home part is what sold me. I'm like, that's <laughs> true. I was like, yeah. I'm like, I want to be waiting for sky trains. Like, I'm like, so I'm like, I'm like, it's better we just stay local. With barbecue. really upset people, right? Like, yeah. the, just experience like the worst yeah. sports day of their like, life. And yeah, regardless, yeah. if we wanted to be great, but if we lost, like, and the way I was looking, like, I'm like, you're right. Like, we'll just stay local. Like, so I wasn't there for all that. But it was such like a high low for us because if you if you remember, like in 2010, we had the Olympics in there. Yeah, it was the best. <laughs> Golden was goals, the best. scores, like, everyone's super Team happy. That was amazing. It was such a great time. So you're like, oh, back to back 2011 connects me to the finals. Like, what's so lucky? I just I knew. I knew, man. <laughs> I don't know if it's just gonna knew. I was like, I'm gonna stay local, I'm not going down there. It's crazy, <laughs> but uh I've tried to get back into hockey a lot since then. I always keep up with it. Like, I'm like it's always like Similar to you, like growing up, it was wrestling and hockey. Like those mm-hmm. were my two loves. Absolutely. Don't get me wrong. Like I like cartoons and X Men and all that stuff too. But like it was wrestling and hockey. Like I either wanted to be a goalie or I wanted to be a wrestler briefly before I broke all my bones. And uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, I I don't know. I hope to get back into it. But it's cool to once again like I I'm not even trying to like blow smoke up your ass, but like to see someone that liked both things and then get to do a little bit of both that. of them. Like that's super cool. Like to look that's back at it for yourself. Yeah. Like you liked wrestling, 
you worked for the WWE mm-hmm. and you liked hockey. Now you're like, uh, you're at the desk. They told you that would be really hard to get at. And that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's been a, I've been lucky. I've also been fortunate and uh, I don't take it lightly. That's for sure. I definitely don't. I think a big topic today, um, and it's happened a lot. Uh, I recently, officially, for the first time after trying so long, uh, got media for the WWE. And they let me go to the Rumble and do interviews and do the little press junket where we're going around uh, getting all the interviews. And I looked around, and I remember I really wanted to get a question with Gunther. So I'm like, oh, Gunther married an Indian woman. So I'm the only person in this room that can ask him, like, the Indian questions. Like, what's your favorite Indian food, et cetera, et cetera. But then it dawned on me that, oh, I'm the only Indian in this room. Mm. So what does representation mean to you? Because for a lot of people that don't know, like you are Muslim, you are Turkish, Mm -hmm. you aren't, you know, you know, and you've opened all these doors for yourself. Has that ever been a hurdle for you or is it? Yeah, it has. Um, I uh, you, you you may relate to this. So early in my career, I actually like was struggling to try and open doors, et cetera. And I considered like changing my stage name. I was actually inspired by a uh, Cal Penn. Yeah. Cause his name is Cal Penn Modi. Right. Yeah. And he changed his name to Cal Penn, uh, in half jokingly. I remember reading an article where he was like, I'm half joking when I'm paraphrasing this part, but he's like, I'm half joking when I say this, but I changed my name so I could get more auditions you know, maybe a more palatable sounding name would open more doors for me. So that kind of stuck with me for a while when I was struggling a little bit. I thought maybe I should change my name to Adam or something. And that would not get my resume thrown out as quickly. Right. Yeah. So um, I'm glad I didn't. I have the opposite now where, you know, it, it, I feel a lot more like uniqueness and and uh, DEI is very embraced, uh, especially where at ESPN, it's very much embraced and uh, places that I work, I feel like more than ever before. Certainly, there's more. There's certainly there's more work to be done in the industry as a whole, yeah. and in general, absolutely. But I would say that we are definitely in a better spot than where we were, and I I say that from a place of personal experience because yeah. I feel like, uh, you know, I put the umlauts on my O for that reason. Like uh, growing up, yeah, Justin Dan, like. There weren't many Muslim people on television to yeah. be inspired by. And if they were, they were typecast into playing terrorists or something mm-hmm. to that effect. I Look no further than the WrestleMania 7 storyline, right? With yeah. Sergeant Slaughter and being an Iraqi sympathizer. Like, imagine me growing up in a Muslim family and there's General Akbar... Um, essentially reciting Muslim prayers on WWE television. Mm -hmm, And I'm hearing this and I'm like, wait a minute, people hate this person. Like these are the villains in this story, Mm -hmm. but I'm hearing things that I hear like on a regular basis in a very peaceful setting, you know? So like it was very, as for, as a kid, it was very jarring. Like it was not, it did not compute in my head in the same way that, someone who would be detached from the situation and understand the story they were trying to tell. You know what I mean? So yeah. like, but like today I, I have less of that concern and I aim like at this stage in my life and career for sure, I aim to be one of those positive inspirations to kids who would want to get into this industry because I didn't have that. It was basically Muhammad Ali and maybe Hakeem Olajuwon and that's about it. Yeah. Right? Like there weren't, so. Muslim or Middle East people from the Middle East, Eurasian hockey players or athletes, really. So I take that very seriously. I do. Yeah. Um, and I, like I said, like I, I made a post about it because I was like, I used to let that compliment fly over my head when people would be like, yo, it's so cool seeing what you're doing. And like, oh, seeing a brown boy doing it, or like a sick boy doing it, or another Punjabi. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, yeah. Cause I just, I don't know. I never really looked at it that way. I was just like, no, I'm just doing this because I'm trying to do something. And I, and I fell on it by accident. Now I'm trying to make it something and yeah. trying to make the wrestling classic. I never looked at that. And then, it wasn't until I was in that room for WWE and I looked around, I was like, oh, this is why it's cool. Because now other little kids that look like me or are raised in families like me want to yes. do something. This, they see me Good doing view. it and then they think they can do it. Don't take that, that lightly either. Because yeah, like, I used to. Is, it didn't dawn on me. No, yeah. no, you shouldn't. You should like, like and, and, and if you like people that come up to you and, and, and give you that compliment, nurture that because it matters to them right? Like it really matters to them because they see a part of themselves in you, 
right? And and, yeah. and it's almost like you have this welcomed responsibility to 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 nurture that and to and and to make it even more positive, you know? Because it, I was yeah. just so focused and driven on like mattering in the first place. To now, like, yeah, I get that like, completely. Oh. Yeah, once I what, once I like, I'm like, now I'm in a good place, I can get into opportunities and stuff. And I'm like, oh, and now I see why, like, that compliment meant a lot to these people. Like, mm -hmm. and that's why I want to ask you because I think you did keep your name and I, and I did watch your TED talk and you talked about how much it meant to you when, when they kept that over the, the accents over the O in your name. Yeah, yeah. And, and then there was just another moment for me where I'm like, oh, yeah, like, there's a lot of us out here doing this stuff. Yes, that's kind of impractical. That matters. That matters. Yeah, that is impractical for, for people in our culture to do. Like <laughs> a lot of our culture is similar in the sense like our parents were immigrants, they came or they worked hard, and yes. they're hoping that we would grow up to be like doctors or accountants and yes. get that steady job and that steady income yep. paycheck and yep. make sure you go to school and get your degree and have a family. And then when a, a bunch of us, you know, first generation, second generation Canadians are like, now nah, I'm gonna go do this instead. It's like a lot of our parents do end up being supportive, but there's a part of them being like, yeah, what are you doing? Why are you yeah. why are you intentionally struggling? Like that they yeah. left their countries so they wouldn't have to struggle and now their kids are intentionally putting themselves in situations yeah. to struggle, like, right? We it's came here to make your life easier, gave you the blueprint to get a good education, yeah. get a good job, the way that we And now you're making and... your life intentionally tough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So it's like I when I look at it from that perspective, I'm like, "Oh, like it, I get it now and it, it does matter that there are, are people like us that are taking this in private like daniel's trying to be a professional wrestler you are in the broadcast industry and you've made both of the things you loved as a kid a, a, an achievement for yourself i don't know i'm whatever i'm doing i'm doing but it's been great and i love every moment of it but and like dan it's not easy man like you know this more than anyone right you're going through it and you're basically like taking bumps and you know get, yeah like it's just like the craziness it's, of the schedule and the yeah. travel and especially at the start of your career the pay isn't great like people don't understand the struggle and the grind like you really have to love it in 100%. order to want to be a wrestler no 100 percent. and i think like you speaking about like rep representation mattering so much like for example growing up like I'm born in 2002, so like you can imagine the people growing up, you know, being on TV like Muhammad Hassan and stuff, like being looked at as like the villains and stuff. And I'm like, wait, why is he the bad guy? I don't understand because you're too young, right? But then as you grow older, and you're like, oh, okay, like this sucks. But then you guys, you see guys like Mustafa Ali, you know, killing it on the Indies now and stuff, and then you know, making sure like their voices are heard and stuff. And it really matters because. And it's Someone, so different. You're so right. So like Sami Zayn, yeah. Mustafa Ali, Sami like Zane, so yeah, many yeah. examples of like wrestlers that are making it into something that matters and 100%. definitely not turning yeah. into a stereotype, you know, yeah. which is which is terrific to see. I was just gonna say it's super cool to see guys like that, you know, like put matters into their own, own Justin, hands. Can I tell you can I tell you a funny story that For you'll sure. appreciate uh 100%. being a Punjabi background? So yeah. one of my favorite gigs was Tiger Fest. Um, oh, yeah. And Brampton, okay, Tiger G, Singh, the Tiger, yeah, Tiger yeah. Lee, yeah, right. So yeah. they were awesome. They were so much fun. And every Canada Day in Brampton, uh, which has a very, very strong uh, Indian yeah. Punjabi community, right? Uh, they would put on wrestling shows, and they would be packed. Mm, and I'm yeah. talking like thousands of people packed. And they're yeah. not all wrestling fans. They were like a very strong um, Indian Punjabi turnout, but there were wrestling fans there too. So. My first one that I did, this was at a, uh, it was at a park in Brampton, like big open field, yeah. ring in the middle. Okay, one of Fuego's rings, Dan. By the way, I don't no, know if I... it was a high spots ring. It, it might have been a high spots ring. I don't know, but it was that. It was a Fuego ring, and it was a bunch of squared circle uh, talent. Uh, I miss those days. We we should have yeah. an off co uh, uh, conversation offline about that, Dan. That's I want to hear what what it's like. But uh, so I'm getting ready to ring announce this. Okay, Justin. So I go to yeah. the Tigers. Big mistake asking this question, but I'm like, hey, like maybe I should say something in Punjabi to the crowd to like, <laughs> you know, get them like, you know, yeah. kind of like a baby face, like a cheap pop, say, yeah. uh, saying something in their language. They wouldn't expect it um, from the ring announcer of a wrestling show. Right. So the Tigers look at each other and they're like, hmm, this seems like a great like in their heads. I can just tell it. This seems like a great opportunity to rib this kid. Yeah. So, like, they come back to me and they're like, we got something for you to say. And Tiger whispers it in my ear. 
And I'm like, all right, all right, I'm going to practice this. I got this. This is going to be great. And I'm like, what does it mean? And they were like, oh, you know, it's just like, hey, you guys are awesome or something like that. And I'm like, okay, great. This is awesome. So I go down to the ring and I'm like, how's everybody doing? And and like everyone's like all riled up and whatever. And I'm like, hey, I can't hear you. Let's make this as loud as we can. I got one thing to say to all of you. May Bonder who? No. <laughs> and, and, and I wait. OK, now imagine me ring announcer and I'm oh, saying I just said this, which translates to uh, I think it translates to you're a monkey or I'm a monkey. I'm, you th I'm a monkey. Yeah. I'm a monkey. So yeah. I'm waiting in the ring, Justin, OK, for the reaction that I'm about to receive. Like, hey, like, give me all the props. OK, <laughs> give me that massive pop from from my amazing Punjabi. OK, and like I hear crickets. Not a single voice. <laughs> Everyone is dead silent, right? So I, yeah. and what do I do? Being the uh, silly greenhorn that I am, I go right back to the well. <laughs> it's like, you said it like again? The spot, the spot didn't work. We botched. Yeah. Let's just go right back and oh just circle around God. and do it again. So I go, May Bonder, who? And I like hold the who, like it's even longer this yeah. time. Oh. And then this person in the front row is like, yeah, we get it. You're a monkey. <laughs> and the whole crowd starts to laugh. And I'm like being laughed out of the ring. Oh so now I'm God. confused. Oh, yeah. I'm like, what yeah. the heck? And I get out of the ring and I just like slink my way backstage. Okay. Yeah. Through the curtain. Guess who the first two people are right behind the curtain? The, the tigers. tigers. Yeah. And they're howling. <laughs> and then they were like, <laughs> they were like, that was a good rib kid, wasn't it? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, you got me really good, Tigers. That Thanks. is amazing. That's right. <laughs> that is amazing. Especially in Brampton, because, yeah, that is a very Punjabi dominant. Yeah, it was yeah, an, excellent. That was one of the oh, best groups wow. played on me, for sure. They got me Do good. You, so uh, we'll wrap this up. Uh, it was a pleasure having you on. Like, there's so much more I want to talk to you about, and I feel like there's a lot we talk about, but it's not, like, interview-worthy. Like, <laughs> yeah, you, but, hit uh, me up anytime, but we can have, absolutely have part two. But I do definitely want to ask you, and I think I've kind of already answered it myself. It's a question I ask everybody at the end. Um, at this point of your career, like now you're doing the stuff with the NHL and hockey. Mm -hmm. um, you've done the stuff with wrestling. We don't know if we'll ever see you involved with wrestling again. Maybe we can pull you in somehow. Maybe Daniel can get you to ring announce a, a, one of his matches or oh, an indie oh, show. Or yeah. maybe I can convince you to do some wrestling stuff together. But that all being said, um, do you feel like you've made your younger self proud? Yes. I do. I, I I think that I I would say younger me would be pretty stoked with some of the stuff that I've been able to do. Mm -hmm. I think that there's still work to be done. I think that because um, I want the other younger selves, you know, like the young people to continue to be inspired. So that's what uh, one of the things that keeps me going. Obviously, providing for their, my family and things like that are for sure. the most important thing. But if you're talking career and what matters to me career wise, sure, I have goals. I have dreams. Uh, that you build upon as you go along and you think about what's next, what are the other things you want to do or what you want to accomplish or, you know, bucket list item kind of things or core memories, that kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I would say that in the way that we got here, the hard work necessary, the passion, the stick to itiveness, that kind of stuff, I think that that would make younger me proud. I think younger me would be really happy to know that, uh, you know, we got to work at WWE and we got to. Uh, do NHL games, you know, the two loves uh, have been activated. So, yeah, I would say I say the short answer is yes, but there's still work to be done. You know, there's there's always there's always things that you want to accomplish in your life. Yeah. So I'm you got you got to keep growing. You got to keep yeah. going and have yeah. goals. And once you get to one point, what's next is kind of a thing. But always remember to sit back and smell the roses because mm -hmm. I've always been told, like, I always used to be so stressed and focused. Like, hey, just, you know, you've done some cool stuff. Yes. And cool. Yes. And other people think you've done some cool stuff you're not you're, you're taking it for granted like dan dan when you stuff. when you when you work for your first when you work your first match in front of like let's say 500 people okay and let's say you're gonna lose the match you're mm -hmm. just you're selling after the match is done and you're and you're laying on the mat just take a second to just absorb that moment yeah like, like let it let you let yourself like just be happy that that occurred do you know what yeah. i'm saying like yeah. i will say that i try to rush as fast as possible through so many steps especially in my 20s i was like no i am laser Same. focused i need to get to point l right now yeah. you yeah. know what i mean like i need yeah. to get to there yesterday and i'm not gonna stop and i'm nothing else matters i wish i had 
exactly like Justin said, I wish I had slowed down and I wish that I had like absorbed every moment because it, it would have been a much more enjoyable ride for sure. Yeah. No, hundred percent. I and I'm in, I'm 32 now and it's the same thing in my twenties. I was so yeah. like, I yeah. gotta do this, 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 this. And now it's more like when something's happening, I try to be really present in that moment, especially when I know what's cool. Like, Hey, be present in this moment and remember it. Cause like, this is a cool moment. Like, I'll ask you actually off a thing that happened to me. So last year on 316 day, I randomly got an email. Not randomly, I knew them to an extent. So I got emailed to come show up to Stone Cold's bar in California and, nice. and uh, be part of 316 day. And I was like, hey, yeah. can I interview Stone Cold? Like, I just threw it out there. I'm like, whatever. If they say no, they say no. But if they say yes, that's cool. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, yeah. uh, and uh, you know, went down there and they said yes and everything. And I people ask me all the time, like, do you ever like get nervous when you meet wrestlers, yada, yada, yada. Like, are you, do you still fab? I'm like, not really. I'm like, most of them are either like around my age or my age or younger than me. And like, I'd be down to have a beer with them and hang out with them. Like, I'd rather like, that's like where the relationships are with more of the modern day wrestlers more than so like, than whatever. But I'm like, I, I, I admit it. I'm like, but sometimes when I meet the people I grew up watching, eh, it's a little different, right? Like, whatever. Like it comes yeah. out a little bit because I grew up watching them. Sure. So I, I, everyone kind of asked me, they're like, oh, so like, you know, you're going to like, I'm going to go meet Stone Cold. Like, how are you nervous? I'm like, oh, I'm not nervous. This feels like work. I'm going to go in there. I'll get this interview, knock it out, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we had a little meet and greet beforehand. Um, and uh, I walked up to him. I'm like, oh, I'm the one that might be interviewing you in a bit. If you're free. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And he shook my hand. He held my hand. He looked dead in my eyes. And he's like, stay sober. Because we're at a bar. But in that moment, it hit me. I'm like, oh, this is Stone Cold Steve Austin. <laughs> that's like, this is so crazy like holy smokes like i've literally watched this guy from the entire part of my life that i can remember from like yeah. six forward like he was the man so uh, did you ever have one of those moments when you were at wwe where like there was maybe like one person where you're like oh I never it happened this. before happened. actually like i when okay. the first time i met roddy piper i was like oh. that uh i would say like roddy piper bret hart uh edge those three helped me a lot early yeah. in my career they gave me so much time they were very gracious with their time uh they every time they were in toronto they would always make sure that i had like as much time like even an hour's worth of time uh, yeah. and they were very good to me like that but the first time i met roddy in particular it was like wow like this is <laughs> surreal to me and i gotta like compose my like like yeah i was definitely like yeah. you know like i was d in fan mode for a lot of that yeah. And try to so, carry yourself so professional yeah and like, like oh, trying and you just you just got to shake it off right like but yeah. eventually like you know this because you've interviewed yeah. a lot of people by now justin but like that wears off to the point where it's not like it's not cool and it's not a welcomed opportunity it's just that you've done it so many times that you can anticipate the emotions or the yeah. gravity you know so that's what that's that's why it doesn't feel as anxious in those moments yeah. anymore mm -hmm. i know and then the, everyone always says like they're like you act like you're nervous and the camera goes on and you're fine but i'm like i'm just going through the motions like i've done it enough times and i started doing interviews for the same reason like daniel said it was a pandemic and i got stuck in vancouver so i was like what am i gonna do from vancouver? And that was, that's what video. everyone started doing that's when everybody started doing interviews everyone figured out stream yard and zoom and i was like i made a <laughs> lot of friends and i've networked with a lot of people might as well and i already had a mic because i had a podcast so i was like might as well just reach out to people I know and get to do interviews and start a thing with Shad. But yeah, no, it's it's crazy. And, I, and I've awesome. interviewed like a few people since that Austin one was where it wasn't like that. But I just like I always thought it's cool because I'm like I'm, I'm I was like I'm not gonna get nervous. It'll be fine. And I was like, oh no, this is the real person. <laughs> <laughs> That's, like, That's awesome. crazy. Yeah. Well, it was a pleasure having you on. I'd love to continue chatting and maybe do this again. And like I said, like for me personally, like like i like i genuinely like it meant a lot when you guys follow the page and support it because i'm one of those people like i started because max girlfriend over me have instagram it grew to become like a bigger thing and more things kept happening and anytime i thought like what am i doing with this thing certain things would happen that would keep me going like oh this person followed me like oh this person's supporting us someone else gave me this compliment sure, sure. somebody said you were this close why would you stop now and and uh some of those things were you guys following early sure. on like oh this is cool people that are already doing cool stuff Think i'm doing something cool so like, exactly. i'm gonna keep doing it so like like i appreciate it but let look like we followed because the content was good right so yeah. like that's that's really the the testament there right that's that's yeah. the testimonial that you need so thanks for having me boys yeah i'll happily come back on and then of course um dan, dan what's your finish uh it's like a running knee i don't know a if running you knee, okay do you remember daniel bryan doing like the running knee Darren? yes yes it's literally that Similar to that same See, the, what I like about that, Justin, is that you can do it on everyone, right? Like they yeah, always say, yeah. pick yeah. a finish that you can do on everyone. 
Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's not like it's not like you're gonna do a pop up power bomb in the next one you're wrestling like the big show and you're like yeah. <laughs> now, now Dan, if we're ever in a triple threat match, uh I will take the finish and kick out at one. Like oh, power, okay. WrestleMania <laughs> eleven oh, power wow. kick out at one. All right. Wow. Massive second wind. Uh, and then Danny was still losing, of course, but <laughs> <laughs> Come on, now. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a pleasure. Hope we catch up soon, guys. Yeah. Everyone go follow Arda. Check out his TED Talk, guys. It's on uh, YouTube. You can find it in the link in his bio. That's how I found it. It was actually really good and inspiring. Super right? good. And yeah. um, like I said, one of the most fascinating things about you is I, I love the fact that I, from my perspective, you created opportunities for yourself. You made something mm-hmm. out of nothing. And I feel... Like I can relate to that, and it was, it's a super cool to see someone live out all their dreams doing that. 100%. Thanks, boys. Yes. See you all later. It's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night.